is going on, everybody? Welcome in to the North End Podcast, episode 131. My name is Zach Graham, your host here in the North End, joined, as always, by my good buddy. He's on record as my best friend. His name is Ian Michaud, and we call him E, 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 E. E, sitting here, midweek, Austin, Texas, beautiful weather outside this week, and feeling pretty good here in the North End podcast offices. We've got a guest today. We'll get to that. We'll start by asking you, as we always do, how you feeling, E? You know, I got a I got a heavy weight on my chest. I got to apologize to the uh, to the listeners here. I know that I said I'd only be celebrating till Monday, but here I am, still thrilled, still super excited about our dub. <laughs> I know I threw you for a whirl there. Saw your face. Didn't know <laughs> what I was throwing out there, but uh, yeah, man, I'm good. Just got a great workout in, so I'm a little sweaty. I don't know the people on the YouTube really want to see that good thing that they can't smell me through smell technology. Um, but yeah, man, I'm great. Uh, we, we took a dive into this San Jose team and I must say that we have another, another present, uh, being s- placed on our doorstep here, a team that's really beat up a team that's really struggling right now coming into the queue. So I'm looking forward to, to talking about this match, looking forward to, uh, introducing our guest here for sure. And uh, man, I'm just ready to get going. And I guess now I can officially put that that FC Frisco win in the rear view. Uh, congrats, boys, again. Uh, let's let's shift our focus to this game coming up on Saturday here. Yeah, I, I see you getting that workout in. Maybe inspired by our guest, we talked about his off season training regimen uh, because Brad Stuver joined us here on the podcast a little bit earlier. So uh, we'll get into that after we preview this San Jose match. We'll talk about some Austin FC news. And of course, we'll close it out with the nonsense, a best ball update. Uh, We'll get some discussion there on the week seven picks. Uh, But before we jump into tonight's episode, just want to remind you, if you haven't yet, Pause the podcast, take five extra seconds, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're watching on the YouTube channel, subscribe to the channel. It helps us grow the podcast. You can hit the notification bell to know when a live stream pops up or a new episode goes live. And of course, on this episode, hit that thumbs up, like the video, help us battle the YouTube algorithm overlords, which you can also do by leaving a comment and joining in on the discussion. Any and all of that you would do for us. We love you for it. Wash yourselves clean in the confetti of the North End. E, couple pieces of news. First, coming out of the weekend, congratulations, Julio Cascante. Team of the match day. Obviously, if you're on that back line anywhere in the league and you score a goal, you got a pretty good shot. Uh, But again, just Julio adding to his total as one of, if not the best offensive center back in the league over the last two plus seasons. Absolutely well deserved. And I know that, you know, you you mentioned there if you get the goal from that defensive line that you're usually going to get the nod, but he put in a complete per- performance on both sides of the ball, got the unorthodox goal there, and uh really, you know, you know, shifted the entire momentum of that game with that, that score in the second half there. So huge shout out to him. Big congrats to Julio. Keep it up, brother. Been playing absolutely fantastic this entire season and uh look forward to seeing him keeping it rolling. Another thing that came out of the victory this past weekend was our first story of the match video from the media team in what feels like years. <laughs> but, you know, you need a win, I think, to get one of those. And so it had been a while. Uh, and I don't know, man, I, I don't know what your thoughts were. Obviously, we enjoy pretty much all of those because they're always after dubs. But um, it felt like to me that the media team had been like just rare to go uh to get one of these out there and i i thought they're they're on they are in mid-season form for sure i mean what they're mvps from last year right the yeah. uh so uh you know I'm, I'm glad that they haven't cheapened it uh, mm-hmm. as much as it has hurt to not have one come up pop up in so long and anything but you know we're keeping that tradition alive where you got to get the dub in order to get the video so i know it was that much more sweet to uh have that released and everything like that so props to them let's get another one this saturday More good news, too, coming through on Instagram. Pictures of Jean Kolmanich in training on Tuesday. Uh, So, again, progressing back to full health here. We we had Coach say he's two to three weeks out last Thursday. We'll see if there's another update 
at this Thursday's media availability after training. Um, it looked like E. I think we have a pretty good eye at this point for like, you know, you get the content out there. You can kind of tell what the guys are doing in practice. It looked like all non-contact stuff to me, which I think makes sense given the timeline. Totally makes sense. And, you know, when he initially went down, I thought disaster right away. I thought potentially another damaged ACL situation, but I'm um, happy to see that it wasn't too serious getting him back into form. Hector has really stepped up in his absence and uh, that's a great thing for us right now. So if we can get, uh, Komanich back in this rotation here, add to the depth and everything, get Biru more more progressed, more acclimated to how we want to play and all that, then you got to feel good about it. So, uh, you know, safe safe practices, Zani. Stay healthy. Yeah. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you back, bud. Absolutely. Uh, and then one last thing here, just, you know, one of, one of our favorite folks that we've met uh, through our, our fandom, through the podcast here, Happy birthday. Belated, I think, by a day or two. But P. Mike Hayes uh, came over, was hanging out with us uh, last Saturday for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. That's how we, we got the first goal when he was over there. So we also got scored on while he was over there. So happy birthday to our buddy P. Mike. Uh, can't wait to see you this weekend, buddy, and celebrate. One of the OGs, man. Um, you know, he's uh, actually not going to be there this upcoming upcoming oh, match. Woo. So we've been searching for some kind of wooju, someone else to infuse into the north end side there that's going to help us propel us to victory and everything. Yeah. <laughs> so couldn't be happier that it was P. Mike, man. And I hope you really enjoyed your day, bro. All right, let's jump into this match preview. San Jose Earthquakes coming to town. E, you were on the match preview article this week, so I'll let you steer the ship here. But one thing I do know... One thing I didn't need to dive into your article to know is that this is one of the few teams in the Western Conference that we have not beaten through our first three seasons in seven tries. So talk to us a little bit more about what we should expect this coming Saturday. You know, it's an opportunity to to cross this one off the list, a team that we haven't conquered yet. Um, like you said, seven matches. We have two two losses uh, or your, yes, two losses, five draws uh, versus them. Last one was at PayPal Park with the screamer mm -hmm. from Owen, arguably his best goal of his young career. Um, so they come in, man, and they're not looking too great. They got one victory on the season, sitting on three points. Uh, that victory was against, I can't believe I'm saying this, yeah. low, lowly Seattle, who finds yeah. themselves as only one of two teams without a victory on the season. Uh, San Jose has given up 13 goals this year, which is the most in the entire league. So they really struggle defensively. Their starting keeper, Danielle, or Danielle, Daniel is uh, <laughs> is out uh, with a hamstring injury. So they've turned to journeyman, 34, 35 year old keeper whose name is escaping me at the moment. William will, Yarbrough. There it is. I will. Uh, I was going to get to it, but uh, thank you for that <laughs> uh, little assist there. So they also are sitting on two guys who got reds in this last game versus Houston. Um, they got other injuries to some key contributors as well. Our boy, Amal Pellegrino, has been hit with <laughs> the North End kiss of death, uh, yeah. <laughs> really struggled the entire start of this season. He has not produced that the way that this that the San Jose Earthquakes have expected him to do so. And now he finds himself on the injury report with a abdominal injury. Um, again, this other player's name is escaping me. Preston Judd, I believe uh -huh. it is. Yeah. He picked up a red. So he was filling in in that starting role for uh Pellegrino, kind of shifting around with him. They do have a Bobasi who we can see, but he hasn't logged 90 minutes yet this season. So I don't know what his fitness is like, if he's fallen out of favor with the coaching staff. But again, just a really big opportunity for the Verde and Black here to beat up on a team that we should beat up on. And, you know, last season we dealt with all kinds of injuries, all kinds of situations with players where we're trying to get guys acclimated, trying to get guys healthy, and nobody showed us any mercy. We shouldn't have expected any, and then we have to return that favor now. So I'm really, really uh, looking forward to this matchup because I think it's a game that we can absolutely dominate as we did versus Frisco, and we left a lot to be desired out there on the pitch versus Frisco this last weekend. So you put a couple goals home away early, this team will fold like a folding chair, and we can have some happy beers, cruise to victory. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. And definitely just being able to cross them off our list as somebody, yeah. you know, who we've beaten now. Who, it's your yeah. boy, right? Thomas, Thomas Viola's big fan. Yeah, yeah. 
B is a Quakes fan. He was talking about coming down for the game. I don't think he's gonna be able to make it down. But uh, you know, we were we were we were talking some shit a couple weeks ago. I think I'm I'm right there with you in terms of um, the state of their club really setting us up for a repeat. Uh, not necessarily performance, but uh, I guess another game script that could play out very similarly to what we saw against FC Dallas. You mentioned the five draws and two losses, four straight draws in this, in this head to head matchup Uh, in terms of those guys that are injured and or suspended, right? You mentioned Judd, you mentioned Jackson, Ewell. Jackson, Ewell, the goal scorer, one of the goal scorers at Q2 last year. Uh, And Judd, I think has actually been keeping uh, Jeremy Abobasi on the bench the last two games. If I recall correctly, I think it's just a form thing, but out of all these injuries, obviously for our best ball team, I wish Pellegrino was in better health, not not so he could play against us, but, you know, last weekend going forward. But that is certainly a boost to us. You mentioned Yarbrough. I think it might be Danielle. Uh, how you say that? He's Brazilian. I don't know. Yeah, that's why I put a little flavor on it. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, he's he is – last year was statistically one of the best keepers in the league. So Yarbrough – got dumped by the Rapids. So again, he has been, uh, you know, a professional throughout his career began, I think with Leon in Liga MX, uh, and then found his way to the MLS. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely, uh, again, multiple places around the pitch, around their formation. They are using backups this Saturday. And again, that like, we're not in perfect health, but we are certainly the favorites coming in here. Not necessarily, uh, you know, I think we're still plus money in most places, but, I'm with you, man. I think we got to feel pretty good about this one. Um, I think the thing I feel worst about is that Judd is suspended. So that means a Bobacy is going to play and he kills us, man. Yeah, he definitely uh, is a thorn in our side. And someone else who is a big thorn in our side and will be on the pitch is Christian Espinosa, who is a very good player. Uh, I talk about it in the article. We've hinted at all or not hinted at. We've we've dived into the uh, negatives that this team is dealing with right now. But I am concerned about that right side with the Argentinian over there and just the uh, lineup that we're going to have to shake up potentially with who's going to be matched up against him. If you have Obreon and you have Hector over there, you're really going to have to be focused on Espinosa this entire time. He's cheeky. He gets other players involved. And I guess a good thing from that is that the other players that are potentially getting involved are not very good. So his crosses, his uh, anticipatory passes – things of that nature is one touch play might not be as lethal given who he's going to be giving the ball to, but he is somebody that we always have to account for. And I talk about it in the article a little bit with potentially the Biru or Hector start. I'm kind of leaning towards Hector. I don't know if he can go again, but just in regard to uh, discipline, defensive understanding, understanding where he needs to be, not to get too far pushed up, on the field and get hit with the counter by a very dangerous Espinosa, I think will be an important factor into this game. And then if we have Johnny and Owen paired on the other side there, I think that's the side that you really want to attack with. That's the side that has to be active. Who's going to be pushed up the field and trying to get us into that attacking third. Also talked about the form of Seba, how mm-hmm. good he looked last weekend how much gooder I expect him to look <laughs> going into this game. That was intentional. Yeah, yeah uh, no, I got you. I got you. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, and I think that this man, he's done everything right now that we've that we've known him to be outside of get that first goal. Once he gets that out of the way, gets that first one in the back of the net, I think you could really see the L crack revenge tour start to begin. So I hope you have your tickets ready for that. Pepe looked great last week. I think as the great connector that we have, being able to shift that possession style from the back line into that attacking third is going to be a key. This is a team, again, that has given up the most goals in the league. They have this backup journeyman keeper in the net, so we can absolutely take advantage of them. And if you get a couple quick goals here early, and I know I've brought that up before, um, obviously getting an early score is always a very good thing. But (laughs) um, I think in this game, you could see this team really quit. They have Mm -hmm. every excuse to quit. They're beat up. They got suspended players. They have one win. They're on the road. You Mm -hmm. put them away early and just handle your business. So um, this is a game, a present, as I said. Hopefully the boys take advantage of it. And, um, you know, 
I just cross these dudes off our list. We owe them. We we re yeah. we really owe them. And we've had some heartbreakers for them in regard to the draws and the way that those games have played out. They've been ugly at times with some late goals, some fluke kind of goals as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this team coming into the queue and seeing if we can, you know, we responded to negativity well mm -hmm. in that FC Dallas game. How do you respond to some positivity here? How do you respond when things looked a little better? Can't get complacent. Can't be content with what we did. We have to move forward and really put this team down. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. Um, you know, we got we got the comeback monkey off our back, right? Mm -hmm. It had been over 500 days. No, I'm, I'm with you. I want to see. Uh, you know, I'm not demanding a goal in the first 15 minutes. Nope. It'd be nice, but let's score first and let's stay ahead, right? Let's kind of go wire to wire, so to speak. Uh, on this team, beat a team that you're supposed to beat, take yep. care of business and move on. Um, so, uh, I would definitely encourage everybody, obviously, to go read the rest of your match preview article. I do have a lineup I've constructed, I want to get your thoughts on, see what you think the team is going to do, what your potential desires are in mm -hmm. our starting 11. Is there anything else, though, uh, after you did your deep dive on San Jose that you wanted to highlight? Uh, I mean, I'm going to keep talking about this pairing of Seba and Diego Rubio uh, mm -hmm. ad nauseum because this is the best striker that Seba has played with in his tenure here at mm -hmm. Austin FC. And, you know, this is now they got their first full game together, logged in this last match. They looked wonderful. I want to see this relationship continue to grow, continue to develop. Seba putting guys in great positions to score goals. So I'm all over the Diego goal as well. I'm all over a Seba goal this week. I think that, you know, you can really take that to the bank and take advantage of that weak defensive line that they're working with back there. Yeah. So taking a look at what I've got here, we're just, we're going to go for at the back. I think, I think you, you probably need, at least you want three of those four or you want all four of those true center backs healthy to really switch things up there at the back. And again, I'm, I would definitely not call for a change tactically here, given what's in front of us. Again, I think a very similar game plan can, can go out there and be just as if not more effective. Um, but I do have a couple changes in this 11 before I get to those changes, let's stick on those center backs. Mm. Matt Hedges off the bench last week. Do you see, think we see another Julio Heinz Ike pairing, or do you want to get Hedges back in there? You see, because for uh, me, for me, Julio is the guy that I, I want Julio in there. He's he is in form right now. If we need to give him a rest, because again, he played what 270 minutes uh, last week in like an eight day span. Um, if he needs a rest, I get it. But right now, he's my number one because of what he brings on offense. Because he's getting extra cover from his teammates from the tactics. He's not getting in so many one-on-one -on -one situations where maybe, you know, some of his shortcomings can be highlighted. Uh, so he's out there for me. So I guess for me, it's between Heinz Ike and, and Matt Hedges. I mean, I understand the Julio and, uh, you know, I did talk about in the article, his yellow card accumulation. I don't want to try him. to get too cute with him here because obviously we have one win. It, it was a great win, but you know, I'm I, I've on record saying you don't want to get too cute with your lineups. You've got to respect no matter who's coming into play. But I could see Hedges getting the start here, given how much Julio played with that international duty, as well as the yellow card accumulation here. I think Heinz like again, man, has been absolutely fantastic in his time. And I just hinted at, uh, you know, potentially Hector there over Biru, just given the defensive discipline that Hector's mm -hmm. going to have and having to account for Espinosa. So other than that, I'm right there with you. I don't want to change the midfield. I don't want to change. I do not. I swear to God, if we're going, he starts. I, I, that would, that would be, I won't say shocking. That would be surprising to me. I, I mean, yes, I absolutely. And, and I just think that it has to be owned again. We saw the way that it worked. We saw the way that we, we, how different we looked with him there. Danny dropped back into that space from in between the attacking mids and mm -hmm. the defensive unit is what is going to push us forward into that offense. So I don't have any real issues with this. Hector, I could see absolutely not getting the start just given yeah. his age, given the, the fitness level that he's going to need to be at. But if I had to change anything, gun to my head, it's B. Cascante for Hedges and Hector. Yeah. When I think here, I've got Biru in this 11, right? On the left. If it is Hector, I think we do see John Gallagher on the left. And maybe that's what happens because 
right now, I think out of Gallagher, Hector, and Biru, I feel most comfortable trying to put Galley on Espinoza and trying to limit his chances to, you know, put dangerous balls in the box or drive in there himself. Um, mm-hmm. So, it, you know, it's tough because I like, obviously, I guess I can't speak for you. I can't speak for everybody else. For me, where I'm at right now, I don't feel like I was giving Hector nearly enough respect in terms of how much he had left in the tank. Same. I still don't, I'm not still, I'm not convinced now that, oh, we can count on Hector for 70 plus minutes every week. I think quite the contrary. Like I'm still very nervous about that, but I, I am, I am to a place now where if he's in the starting lineup against a team like this, I, I'm not batting an eye. Yeah. I mean, it's really going to be an offensive defensive tra- kind of trade off, right? Because you have the Gallagher and Wolf pairing that looked really well. I think that that's a side that we can attack them on, but if you want to account for Espinosa and make sure, and just like take you take him out of the game, man, they aren't going to have much going on. And I also expect them to try to muck this game up as well. They're going to mm-hmm. try to walk out of here with a point, you know, like a, a nil, nil draw one, one draw at any point in time. So if you can get Espinosa just kind of removed for this game, really focus on him, uh, defensively, then they're going to struggle, man. Um, it really just comes down to how you're going to view what we want to take away from the attack, because I don't know how comfortable I am with the Biru wolf pairing. I think that there, it could be a lot to be desired in mm-hmm. that regard, if that's how we shift it. And with Hector, I think, you know, the man's a veteran. He's focused. Komanich is going to be coming back at some point in time, which is going to limit his minutes again. So I think in this spot where you have an opportunity to get him some more time, you can trust him. You know what I mean? Like we do Mm -hmm. need to put some more respect on his name because you can absolutely trust him to do his job. So, uh, you know, that's, that's where I'm looking in regard to what we could tinker with everything else. I do not want to touch. I don't want, I don't want to see Finley out there. I definitely don't want to see Ragoni out there. G is a G. 20 minute guy, if that yeah. now, depending yeah. on how Rubio's looking. Unless so. you need the rotation, right? We got in, yep. I want to say it's May. We I think in May we have two double game weeks. So that's yeah. when we're gonna see, right? And we were talking back when Rubio got signed in December, right? Uh oh, and we heard uh th- through the grapevine that that Diego Rubio contract might be even cheaper than 350k. So we should be about a month, give or take, away from, from MLS salary dump day. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Just see, mm. just see how the ingredients are simmering on the stove. You know, <laughs> check the oven, all that, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's when we'll see these these rotational changes, right? It's it's not when we have one match a week. Correct. Now is not the time. So, um, you know, I'm I'm good with this one. I'm good with what we rolled out last week. If we had to tinker with it, I've I've said my piece on that. Yeah, same. Yeah, I'm with you. If it's not Owen out there, give me Finley. Just. Let's just keep her going away until you absolutely need a body, right? Yep. That's what he, that's what he has been resigned to, and there's mm-hmm. nobody's fault other than him because he yep. has gotten every opportunity in the world to prove that he can be somebody that we can count on, and he has not done it. So I'm I should drop you. to a 19 year old man, like I, yeah, and yeah. He, honestly, and like I talked about it with you, and I don't know how much flack this is going to get just because of you know who Owen is and his last name, but I bet you we would have gone to that sooner. If it weren't for his last name, you might be correct. And I think it's, it's not necessarily his last name. I think for me, the bigger factor is the designated player spot yes. and yeah. the salary. Okay. I think to me, that's more of like the leash was longer on Ragoni for that rather than, you know, but I, I also think that, you know, the perception of, of Owen, like as much as Josh wants to say, he doesn't pay attention to the media and, and the fan discussion, the discourse, he does at least some of that. Of course. Um, so the, the, the whole coaching staff is cognizant of, of those things. I mean, this is a team. You look at this lineup right here. This is a team that should absolutely beat the shit out of the San Jose club. Yeah. I might stop short of just beat the shit out of, but it'd be fun. I, mean, I just I, don't know if we're beating the shit out of anybody right now. Like we did statistically last week and to the eye test. But again, it, like until I see a fucking three, four goal output, it's tough for me to call it. Maybe you're going to call one here, though. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm i on record in the article as a 3-1 dub here. This team cannot guard. They cannot defend. They have a backup keeper in. You play the game that you played last week versus this team, you beat the shit out of them. I, you're convincing me. Hey, come on. Jump on um, board. 
I wanted I want to say two one because Jeremy Abovasi. I just like when he's on the pitch against us, the fucker scores. I, he, I, I mean, I he know. can fly like he just. Oh, he crushes us. So it's 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 tough for me to say clean sheet, but given who's in the North End today, I'm gonna yeah. say two nil Austin clean sheet for Bradley Scott Stuver. So three one for E, two nil for me. And hey, boys, we don't care how you get it done. Another three points. Let's build some momentum headed out on the road for the next couple games. And E, how about we uh, how about we talk to Bradley Scott Stuver? Couldn't be happier to do so. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, coming up is our interview with Brad. Uh, very, very gracious with his time. And if you know, all of you guys know this, but we're happy to report he is indeed the fucking man. So here's <laughs> our interview with Bradley Scott Stuver. All right, everybody, we teased it earlier in the episode. We are overwhelmingly excited to welcome our guest today. He's an SB nominated starting goalkeeper for everybody's favorite team, Austin FC. He led the MLS in saves during the 2023 season. Still on top of that category early in 2024. It is Bradley Scott Stuver. Brad, thanks a ton for stopping by, man. Really appreciate the time government name thanks thanks for having me on. <laughs> that is that is how you are uh typically referred to here in the north end uh so and i, I promise it's it's all good it's all love here um, yeah i was gonna say and, normally it's a bad thing i only hear it from my mom whenever i'm in trouble but i'm glad that we reworked that into a good thing yeah we, we've uh we've gotten some good feedback on it too so we keep it rolling um but we'll jump in right here I, again appreciate you giving us the time uh, born in, in Mayfield, Ohio, on the outskirts, outskirts of Cleveland. Uh, you had 12 goals and three assists as a midfielder for the Twinsburg High School Tigers to go along with 24 shutouts and net. So my first question is jumping all the way back to high school, uh, as me and E were kind of saying, uh, dang, Brad is, is younger than both of us. You and I were actually both class of 09. When did those goals come? Because like, was there another collegiate level keeper on the roster? Like, how did your coach decide where you were going to play? Uh, so my freshman, sophomore, junior year, I played strictly in goal. Uh, my senior year, we started off the season and uh, we had a little bit, uh, like we had a light class my senior year. Uh, we didn't have as many field players as we did in the past. And about six, seven games in, uh, my coach looks at me and he was like, hey, do you think it would be possible to bring you out a goal? We had a freshman at the time that uh, he went on. He actually went on to kick for um, in college uh, for football. But okay. he was uh, a goalkeeper prospect at the time. We had really high hopes that he was going to go on and play in college. So we put him in goal. I came out and played midfield uh, and ended up playing the field for the, the rest of that season my senior year of high school oh man i mean pretty darn productive there for, for <laughs> one year right 12 goals 12 goals three assists uh then obviously going on cleveland state 71 appearances during your collegiate career high horizon league goalkeeper of the year as a sophomore tournament title and an ncaa tournament appearance as a senior uh plenty of other accolades in between there but let's jump ahead to your professional career because one thing that that we've noticed, um, you know, getting to to know about this league and talking to or interviewing current or former players is that there's kind of a, a small world type of feel to the community of players and coaches in the states, um, like a high level of overlap. Like for example, you're drafted 32nd overall in the 2013 draft by Montreal. They then opted to keep Maxine Crepeau, uh, who was a graduate of, the, of their academy, on their roster that year. And then you're selected by the crew in the waiver draft. Only other player in that waiver draft process taken was Paolo Del Piccolo, who's now an assistant at Louisville City after playing there for seven seasons. And now, of course, Damian lost there in Louisville on loan. So I guess my question to you, long-winded there, can you think of a past connection that you have to a player or a coach in your career that Austin fans might be surprised to know existed? Ooh, I don't know. There are just, there are so many connections that you make. I mean, I've been in this league for 12 years now. Uh, I've played on a few different teams. My first year as a league pool, I kind of jumped around as well. 
Um, I guess I'll say the, I guess we'll keep it Austin based. Uh, our high performance director, Dave Tenney was the high performance director at Seattle Sounders, uh, okay. when I was in college and, uh, the Sounders were actually the first team that I went and trained with when I was in college. And Dave Tenney was the, uh, high performance director there when I trained there when I was in college. So I actually met Dave way too long ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we come back together here in uh, Austin. I don't think he remembers it because there were so many college kids coming in and out, but uh, it was something that I remember because that was like my first introduction in the MLS and pro soccer. Yeah. I'm like full circle now, both of you guys here in Austin. Um, uh, this is a lot of me talking, so I'll, I'll let Ian ask some questions here. Hey, I'm enjoying myself. And, you know, we, we say Bradley Scott Stuber because we're putting the ultimate respect on your name in that <laughs> regard. So, uh, you know, we follow everything that you talk about. And in the media availability a few weeks back, you were talking about this improved strength routine that you were going through. What was like the motivation to try to put on some extra pounds? At first, I was a little concerned because like you're very nimble on your feet. You're quick off the ground. And I thought maybe those extra pounds could hinder that but uh what was the impetus to get that kind of going and what results and like benefits have you seen uh to start this season from that yeah that was that was one of my fears as well uh obviously when you put on a little bit more mass you're always worried about losing a little bit of um reaction time and kind of quickness so that was something that i worked extremely uh hard on in the off season to make sure that we were putting weight on in the right way and making sure that uh, we didn't lose anything, but it all stemmed kind of from last year. The first two years, I was able to uh, kind of maintain my weight a little bit better. Uh, last year, with the congestion of games and the amount of travel and like Leagues Cup coming in, Champions Cup, Open Cup, kind of all of those different tournaments, uh, I wasn't able to maintain my weight as much last year. And I actually ended the season at like my all time low. Like in mm. 11 years, I was at the lowest weight that I had ever been on. So uh, talking with the high performance staff, I just wanted to make sure that we came into this preseason with uh, a little bit ahead of the curve. Uh, I wanted to make sure as I'm getting older, I wanted to make sure that I like take care of my body more preventative. So um, being in the gym a little bit more can help with injury prevention. Um, and we have our team here is amazing. The amount of data points, the amount of testing that we do um, just to make sure that our bodies are in the shape that they need to be in, or if something looks a little bit off, just tweaking our uh, routine to make sure that uh, we get things under control. So um, super proud to have worked with this group um, for them supporting what I wanted to do. And uh, right now I'm feeling, feeling pretty good and maintaining all the work that we put in in the off season. Absolutely. And it looks like it's been paying off. And I mean, you've dealt with an insane amount of shots uh, so far this season. So what's something that you're looking at or the staff is looking at in order to kind of like alleviate the pressure that you're facing? And is that part of like our game plan strategy to allow maybe some of these shots from outside of the box to be coming into play and then letting one of our best players handle that business afterwards? Yeah, I think if you look at the past three seasons as well. Uh, we're giving up similar amounts of shots, but it all depends on kind of the type of shots that we're giving up. I think in years past, we were getting hit a lot in transition and those shots were a little bit more difficult because it was two attackers versus one defender and myself. Uh, I think this year, the shots that we're giving up are coming through traffic. Um, I think we have a really good amount of defenders behind the ball, um, making shots more difficult, making shots a little bit more predictable. Um, and just because we're giving up shots doesn't mean that we're giving up quality chances, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So I think what we look at is the, the amount of quality chances, the amount of um, saves that are kind of tilted toward just routine versus ones that are a little bit more difficult uh, outside of the Minnesota game. I think we've done uh, a really good job of kind of mitigating those and making uh, life a little bit easier in the back. Totally agree with that. And we see the deflections and everything from these defenders in front of you, which has been huge. So uh, that's, that's awesome. Happy to hear that. Uh, last one from me here. Um, you know, we've seen the roster construction. We've seen the, the uh, surgence of Damian loss from the next row level, bringing in Bersano. 
and then Cleveland as well in this offseason. So you've worked really hard throughout your career to secure uh, a starting position, starting role as one of the top keepers in the league. Um, so what's something that you're like using to maintain your edge while also being, you know, a leader and somebody who's helping progress some of these younger guys along? Yeah. Um, I mean, welcome to professional sports, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, goalkeepers, we are a unique group. Uh, we work together more than any other group of players on the field. Uh, we have our individualized training that we do every day with each other. Um, we try and like, we're the one shooting on each other. We're the one giving each other service. So uh, having a good relationship within the goalkeeper group is something that we've had every year that I've been here in Austin. And it's truly been amazing to be part of a group that wants to make each other better every day, no matter what. And uh, going back to my very first year, my goal was always to make the guy next to me better, make the the group the best group in MLS, because no matter what happens, this team is going to rely on their goalkeeper to come in and do the job. And um, whether that's me, whether that's Steph, whether that's Matt, whether that's Damian, all of us need to be ready to step in and get the job done because that's what's going to help the team win. Um, but for me, I just, the only thing I can focus on is myself. Uh, I can focus on what I do every day, the standard that I hold myself to every day. Um, I'll be my harshest critic, no matter what happens, uh, mistakes, wins, accolades, no matter what it is, I'm always going to be the one that's watching film. I'm going to be the one that's asking, could I have done more? Um, that's kind of always how I've been. And, uh, if I'm the hardest person on myself, no one else can kind of tell me anything. So, um, I still have a lot of individual goals that I want to accomplish and um, I'm going to do my best to help the guys around me, but ultimately I'm going to make sure that uh, I continue to be consistent and play well and uh, make sure that I'm helping the team win on the weekends. I love that, man. That's fantastic. All right. I'm going to kick it back to Zach here for you. So just sticking with the positional group real quick, and, and in particular, Damien, because we have a segment on the pod that we've dedicated now to following Damien on his loan this Good. year. And obviously, that segment has been all positives, uh, as we expected, right, uh, early in their season. But what's the relationship been like with Damien in past seasons in Austin? And like now from afar, right, now that he's on loan with Louisville, he's the widely suspected heir to the Austin goalkeeper throne at some point amongst the fans here. So like we saw you guys talking before the, the preseason exhibition that was actually his first time putting on the Louisville kit. Uh, so that was, that was fun to see, but do you guys get to communicate much now that the season has started for both of you? Yeah, I try and text him uh, before every game. Uh, I know life gets a little bit busy and sometimes we miss each other, but uh, I mean, they've started the season three and oh they've given up one goal they just dismantled their last opponent five nothing so um i actually i need to text him because i was going to make a joke that the save that i had in this past game was very damian loss esque uh, <laughs> so uh i mean communication's been good he's uh he's such a good kid and uh he he has like the work ethic that you need to succeed at the very highest level. And for him, it's just about playing games and continuing to grow as a goalkeeper. And I mean, he has such a long career ahead of him. Uh, he just needs to keep working, keep growing, keep proving every step of the way that he is who he is. And uh, I'm excited to see uh, where his career takes him. Yeah, us as well, man. I mean, the it's funny that all, of all the things that he did last year, the one thing that sticks out to me in terms of that competitive nature was when he was doing goalie wars and he was legitimately pissed that he didn't he didn't get that crown so anyways we'll get back to you sir uh, a couple quick hitters here before we let you go um closest you ever came to hanging up the gloves in your career to this point because i mean you've been almost everywhere you mentioned the year as a pool goalkeeper for the league which to be honest i don't even know if that exists anymore but you were out with four different teams yeah. that year uh then with the crew loaned out to dayton to wilmington then with new york now with austin like was there ever a point where you considered retiring uh i don't think i ever considered retiring but there were a couple moments that were extremely difficult um i think the 
the most difficult time for me was uh, the 2017 preseason. Uh, Steve Clark had just left Columbus. Uh, Zach Steffen had just come in. And it was kind of an open competition to between me and Zach to see who was going to win the starting spot. And I thought I did well in preseason. Obviously, Zach is the goalkeeper that he is. And he went on to go to Man City and do amazing things. And now he's back with Colorado. Um, but when I got passed over for that starting job, I was uh, I was pretty emotional and things got a little bit rocky there. But um, that was why at the end of that season, I asked for a move away from Columbus because I needed a, uh, a change of scenery. I needed a new challenge and um, ended ended up going to New York. But I think that was probably the hardest year for me, just mentally um, going through a battle and losing it uh, and then having to be a good teammate having to make sure that Zach was ready because I wanted the team to succeed and um, just making sure that I was playing well as, as well, because I knew at the end of the season that I needed to be in my top form because I was wanting to go to another team. And if I didn't show well enough in the moments that I had, I wasn't going to be able to go anywhere. So um, despite the tough moment, uh, it taught me a lot and gave me a lot of insight into things. And um, now looking back, it molded me and shaped me into who I am. So very grateful for the experience, even though it was difficult. Well, we're grateful for your stick to because now 104 appearances in your Austin tenure, a couple questions about the last three plus years or so favorite Austin FC memory. Um, I mean, I guess it's going to be the real salt Lake first playoff win. Yeah. He can shoot out, uh, That'll be my favorite. Yeah, that's up there for until me the too. cup. Yeah. Until the cup comes. That yeah, yeah, we that was... it up until now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we we keep the vibes high here, but I gotta ask: least favorite Austin FC memory? Um, I'll go. Wow. Damn, E, good question. Look at that. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm like trying to think. The positive pot over here, man. We, yeah. we had to switch it up a little bit. Yeah, the positives are so easy. I could rattle <laughs> off five or six of them. Uh, I'll go probably St. Louis last year, just giving up that amount of goals. And then yep. me being a dumbass and throwing yep. and lifting them one in the very final moments. I'll we go got, with that we, one. We wanted to get you to curse here. So dumbass is not as heavy as we go all the time here, but uh, you're, in the, you're in the North what the End. Pod so. rules were because yeah. <laughs> my everyday vernacular is not great when it comes to cuss words. It's you'd, like you'd fit in. Word. You'd fit in awesome here. Bro. Welcome <laughs> to the club, brother. <laughs> Welcome you, to the club. Yeah, you, you you hear us. You didn't know it was us, but we're right behind you there in the North oh, yeah. End. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, speaking of that, um, on either end of the stadium, most memorable save you've made at Q2? Uh, I mean, it's got to be the the PK save that yeah. goes the crossbar. Uh, knew that uh, knew that one was coming after you said, oh, yeah, that, that was one, your favorite memory. I feel like that's just the one that I've seen the most, the one that's been replayed the most, kind of had the biggest significance. But but yeah, that one was that one's up there. All right, so Ian and I both, we met playing college basketball down at St. Ed's in South Austin. Um, I went on to coach for for a number of years, small college. One of our favorite things um, during our experiences there was like away trips, being on the road with the guys. If you can share one favorite memory from an away trip with the guys off the field. Um, so I would say that the best, wow. I don't know. There's been a bunch like preseason is always great because we're always together and we're always out doing things. Right. Um, I don't know. I guess it would have been a couple years ago. We were out to a team dinner. I think it was in LA before the LAFC game. And John Gallagher had taught uh, Ruben Gabrielson like a joke. And it's uh -huh. just like this continuous joke. And at dinner, because Ruben was a new player, we had him stand up introduce himself and he just like started telling this joke and it just turned into like this five minute rant of like players going back and forth and other players jumped in and um but that's just like one that sticks out in my mind yeah but I had so many throughout the years like every year brings new characters into the like into the fold 
this year, Biro is actually one of the funniest guys on the team. Okay. Uh, okay. He immediately, as soon as he got here, he got an English tutor. He's been studying like two to three times a week to learn English. Nice. And he walks in every day and he's like trying to integrate what he's saying uh, or like That's what awesome. he's learning, like into the locker room. And it's just, it's amazing to watch. And like, it's, it's also funny because we try and poke fun at him in Portuguese, but there's these little moments of just like, different things that it's hard to pinpoint one yeah. pinpoint 10 a year so for sure yeah yeah there's a lot especially in an mls season man you guys off season just is goes in a blink um yeah we see we see each other a lot so yeah <laughs> yeah all right couple more i gotta ask you can see some of the things on the wall behind me you're born near cleveland browns Bengals, or steelers browns well, i'm sorry <laughs> although the, you man. know Things things looking up, I guess. Looking up there in Cleveland. My family is split. So a lot of my family is in Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. they are Steelers fans. But for whatever reason, my dad and my grandpa diverted. They were yeah. Browns fans living in Pennsylvania. And then when <laughs> we moved to Cleveland, it was just Browns fans. So there you go. Well, that's so all is right. that the LeBron guy? I am a Cleveland Cavs guy. Okay. Okay. Mm, We're, see, he's a mercenary. He's yeah. He's, wherever I mean, I'm needed, I go. I am a big LeBron fan because of yeah. what he did for Cleveland. I also love what he does in Akron. Uh, yeah. Just like all of the philanthropy that he does for where he came up. Um, but I'm not like actively rooting for him now that he does not play for the Cavs. Understood. Mm. Understood. <laughs> I don't have like the the James Heat jersey or the James Laker jersey. That's not. Yeah. See, we don't do that here, E. I thought, you, hey, teach their own, man. I could bust out all 12 of my jerseys right now. <laughs> I'm a team guy, not a player guy. Yeah, there yeah. we go. He has right. me in his phone as the uh, the NBA atheist. Yeah, is my, no, it's just, is my... just NBA atheist. It's all one NBA way. atheist. Yeah. <laughs> just follow right, the players. Right. You know? just, yeah. <laughs> one thing that you wish Austin FC fans would do more of. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Are you saying we're doing too much already? <laughs> can't say sing more. You're singing yeah. for that as it is. Yeah. Can't say do more in the community. Already doing that. Learn the entire Bradley Scott Stuver touch the pre-game warm, the warm up. up. Yeah. Bop, bop. Because you know, we do it. Out of post touches. I don't know if the South End knows that. I know the North End knows it. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. The South End knows it. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we'll say the South End. All right. Well, what about what about one thing you wish fans would do less of? I'm putting you on the spot. There's got to be something. <laughs> you can fandom. tell us talk. It's okay. <laughs> no, but I mean, even when I'm watching sports, I'm like, oh, they should have done this. Like, whatever. Like, part of um, being a fan, right? Yeah, it's just emotions run high. You want to see the team win. Like, I get it. Um, well, hey, okay, last question. Speaking of a win, right? It's been a turbulent start to the year, but you're coming off that first win of the season. Me and E like to sit after the match, win, loss, or draw, and kind of take in the postgame activities, whether it's, you know, player interactions, coaches, what have you. After the win against Dallas on Saturday, you did your customary lap around the stadium, right, thanking all the fans. But this time you hopped the boards and did almost a full lap around the first row, you know, high five and fans. So, like, I, th I don't think that's the first time you've done that, but it's still a rarity. So I guess it's a two part question before we get you out of here. Did Saturday's win mean a little bit more to you than your average victory here in Austin? And what needs to happen in your mind going forward to make sure the team can build some momentum off that win? Because there's a tough April schedule ahead. Yeah, that one definitely felt different. Uh, obviously first one of the year, fantastic. Just the way that we played amazing. Um, being able to put just a complete performance together after having so many good moments in these other games and just not capitalizing on what we could have and rewarding ourselves with the final three points. Uh, I think especially against an in-state rival when Copa Teos is on the line at home in Q2 stadium, it just felt a little bit different. Like, 
it felt like, okay, there it is. That's what we've been waiting for. That's the domino that's going to fall for everything. That's going to give us the confidence to go into uh, this next stretch of games. Um, but I mean, I think the group is in a good spot and I think that's just going to culminate. Uh, I know we still San Jose at home. They always are uh, a little bit difficult to play against. Yeah. St. Louis away, always a difficult place to go. Best in the West last year. So we know that there's going to be some games coming up that are going to be difficult, but uh, right now we want to just make sure that what we did on Saturday against Dallas um, becomes more consistent. And that's kind of the mindset that we're going into using that as a catalyst to show like, okay, we rewarded ourselves. Now let's do it again and do it again and do it again. Because in reality, we have 28 games left and our ultimate goal is to be in the playoffs. So as much as Saturday felt good, we know that um, our top tier goal is to be in playoffs at the end of the year. I love it. You know, we'll be there love with it. you guys every step of the way. Um, before you get out of here, I know, you know, laundry project, all the other things you're involved in here in the community. I just want to give you the space to talk about any and all of that that you have going on because you can articulate what's going on there much better than we can. You're going to need a whole nother pod for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, so I'll make it quick. Uh, April, big month for Laundry Project. We have a laundry supply drive going on at Hop Squad on Sunday. Okay. Uh, you can drop off laundry supplies from one to three. Our, our actual Laundry Project date is April 28th, end of the month. Uh, we'll be doing three different locations that day, kind of like normal. Um, and then, I mean, my work with Equality Texas is always ongoing. There's plenty of stuff going on. But that's really not going to um, ramp up until uh, Pride Month in June. And then um, also with uh, Austin Pride, which is in August for some crazy reason. <laughs> it's, a hot, it's a hot one. Yeah. <laughs> I asked why they do Pride in August. And they said it's like a historical thing where like hotels were booked during June. Mm -hmm. so the city of Austin was like, yeah, we'll just move pride in Austin to August. And I was like, you know that we live in Austin, Texas, yeah. right? The weather is 110 degrees. Right. Yeah, <laughs> Willie, Willie got out of here because of it. Yeah. It was too hot. He had to yeah. go up to Pennsylvania, man. I mean, I don't blame him. I yeah. Mean, yeah. We joke all the time. We would love to have a three-month vacation away from this state, but <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know MLS still hasn't figured it out. We've got some 7.30 kickoffs on the schedule that I imagine will be 8 or 8.30 by the time we get there. So I'm guessing that those will get changed. I feel like yeah. they've gotten changed every year up until mm -hmm. this point. So, Well, everybody, Brad Stuver. Brad, we really appreciate it once again. Appreciate the time. Appreciate all the work you're doing for everybody's favorite team here in Austin. Uh, hope we can have you back at some point, man. Good luck this weekend. Yeah, appreciate the space. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Brad. Just want to thank Brad once again. Uh, that was super cool for both of us. He um, really generous with his time. I mean, you know, played along with some of our our silly questions. Um, but yeah, that that was awesome. Really appreciate it. Yeah, man, I was geeks. That was awesome. You know, he got the workout in after he started talking about the strength days, and he made time for us there. So uh, just. Couldn't be couldn't be more appreciative of him and uh, you know of his answers there and that we got to have a little fun with our boy. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Bradley Scott Stuver, so much, man. I'm glad yeah. you like the the government, the full government name. Yeah, <laughs> I said we. I, th I think we got the approval. Continue using it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Before we close it out with the nonsense, just a quick update on that GA Cup. Uh, both teams were playing for a spot in the championship bracket. On Monday, um, U15s took on Valencia and Apple TV. It was a rough one, E, 5-0 victory for Valencia. But me watching that, like, again, it's not the same U15s that won the title last year. A lot of those guys graduated to U17. Some of them have signed on amateur agreements with FCTO. Um, but I, tr I, I know it can be cliche. I really think that no matter what happens when you go to a tournament like this, getting to play an academy like Valencia – is great experience for the guys. So like, hopefully those guys are, are able to, to, you know,
take some some learnings away, I guess some lessons away is a better way to say that. Some lessons away from that game. And, uh, you know, congrats to Coach Olivares, our good buddy, on uh, another strong showing. Uh, they will be in the premier bracket, which I think, you know, would be the the silver if the top one was was gold. Um, U-17s, they beat River Plate 1-0, uh, but they do fall just short of the championship bracket qualification there, kind of as one of those at, uh, the wild card at-large spots, so to speak. So mm-hmm. they are also in the premier bracket. But that play begins today, actually, out in Florida. So we'll have some more Academy updates on Sunday's episode. I mean, yeah, I hope that they can take some lessons away from it. I think it's hard when you're a 15-year-old teenager. You know, you want to win so badly. But that's a hell of a team, a hell of an organization yeah. that they were up against there. So uh, chin up, chin up, boys. And, uh, you know, we, we press on. And we press on into the nonsense. So, E, before we get to the Week 7 picks and that discussion, Best Ball League update. And we've got Phil West back on top, opens up a four-point lead on our boys at the Verde Pendant. Uh, But Moon Tower Soccer wins the week with a massive 55-point score. Um, Let me pull up the box scores because I know we were sitting there. You and I were feeling pretty good. North End Podcast 43, Mm -hmm. new season high for us, closing the gap in the spoon race there. Um, But we were looking at, at scores headed towards the stadium on Saturday, leaving the stadium on Saturday. And we knew these Moon Tower bastards, Georgie Mihailovic, 18 points on the week. They get 12 from Atuesta. They get 10 from Suarez. They get nine from Gabriel Peck. They get six from Gallagher. E, that was a 55-point score for Moon Tower with zero from their keepers. The ceiling on their team, once again, those Moon Tower bastards, uh, you know, looking good. And now just 25 points back of Phil in first. Yeah, you know, we're going to need some big weeks to make up some ground. That's for sure. But we got a long season. Phil, I remember the other week talking about he's got injuries too. Bro, you drafted an injured player. <laughs> like you drafted somebody he who did? was out. Like that's he not, did. you didn't get dinged up. You, yeah, that's like, that was his only injury at that point too. I think. <laughs> it was like, I, I was confused by that, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Texas Spring of Fire, we're, we're coming for you. Don't worry. We'll, we'll, you'll be in our rear view pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, well, Texas Ring of Fire had, talking about injuries, Gregerson, Leuven, Reynoso, Ferreira, Messi, all out for Texas Ring of Fire. 31 points for them. I think I can check the full standings. Honestly, that's pretty respectable for, for the amount of dudes they had out. Yeah, no, and, and 31 in three of the last four weeks, the week that they didn't score 31, they scored 32. So mm. they're consistent. Yeah, if anything, uh, which unfortunately is not what you want to be in best ball. You want you want those ceiling scores. And we are Austin TV stayed afloat. Thirty nine points, 19 of those coming from Chicho and his hat trick for RSL. So Chicho saving the day for we are Austin TV. Moon Towers big week now pulls them into a tie for third with the we are Austin TV boys. And I mentioned we made up some ground there on Texas ring of fire in the spoon race. We're now just three points back of fifth. So again, it is a long season. Everybody still in flux Uh, looking forward to week seven. Absolutely. I mean, you see those top four teams and they have really established themselves. So we got a ways to go, but you know, I am, it's heating up. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm glad everybody's enjoying it, talking their shit and everything. Those Verde Pendant boys. (laughs) They don't stop, bro. I tell you what. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's get to the picks and we can summarize week six, which, man, when we were leaving the stadium and looking at scores, we were like, oh, we're going to get crushed this week. Yeah. Turned out it wasn't too bad. Uh, No profit on the week, though. We end up going negative 1.06 units on the week, which takes us to negative uh, 4.99. So not quite negative five yet. Um, We did miss on LAFC. They get a red card and lose that one to Colorado late on. Orlando City got a draw at home. Uh, FC Cincinnati drew on the road with Charlotte. Mm. But we did get Austin FC plus 160. Atlanta United minus 135. They take care of business on Sunday along with a Yorgos Yakumakis goal, which helped us because the only uh, only two goals, uh, goal scorers rather, that converted for us last week were Aaron Bupenza and Hanny Mukhtar. So, again, those guys coming through were big time for us. Uh, three goals on the week, Bupenza, Mukhtar, as plus 260, plus 200, and plus 110, respectively. Yorgos, uh, the last guy there. That so a couple, a machine. Yeah, he is. And a I can tell you, machine. 
we're going right back to him this week because Yorgos right now is listed at plus 200 to score. And I don't really care who he's playing against. Uh, like you mentioned, he's just churning out goals. And so we're going to continue to ride that. I'm also looking at Tiago Almada. Don't think he has scored yet this season. Plenty capable, plus 290 Atlanta on the road uh, this week. Let me pull up the matchups once again. Atlanta on the road this week at NYCFC, who has had a tough start to the season, playing mm. on, on that small field at Yankee Stadium. Uh, we'll, we'll lock in one of those come Friday. Again, a uh, weekly picks article posted after the injury report comes out on Friday evening. Uh, but let's not get too ahead of ourselves. We're going to the good guys this week, right? Plus 120 at home. That feels pretty good. That feels very good. I, we talked about it, man. This is this is a team we got to beat. So yeah. uh, I like that a lot. I think we got to go back to Seba to score again here. He's plus 220. But I'm also eyeing some of these alternate goal props. I don't know if we're going to be so bold. But Drew C scoring the first goal or the last goal of the match is plus 330. And him to score a brace is plus 1,600. So we might have to sprinkle maybe a half unit, maybe a core. I don't know. But yeah. he's he's been so close to scoring one, two, three goals already in his limited time. I feel like he gets one this weekend. And if he's got to score two against anybody, this San Jose team right now, you mentioned, giving up the most goals in the league so far. This is the week right now. And, you know, like, let's roll the dice here because you get him with that brace. And also, that's the best ball. A little best ball. Oh, yeah. too. <laughs> you're right. You're right. You know, so I'm I'm all for throwing half a unit on that and letting it go and letting our boy really show out. Yeah. So looking at those two, um, I do want to look at that Red Bull injury report come Friday because our boy Emil Forsberg sat out with the hammy issue last week. He was questionable. So if he's back, I don't think I want to mess with Cincy even at home. But if Forsberg is out, again, Red Bull still quite respectable even without him. But since he at home at plus 110, if there is no Forsberg, I, I think we'll probably lock that in if, if that's what happens. You know, I can't hate it. And I mean, uh, who did we have him against last week? Oh, Charlotte. Orlando, man. Or, and you no, know, Charlotte. Or uh, you talking about Red Bulls? Yeah. Yeah. So we had Cincy last week against Charlotte and we had uh, Orlando against Red Bulls and, yep. and both ended up in, in one, one draws. And I mean, we've talked about uh, Emil Forsberg and how good he is and everything and what he brings to the table, but still they're getting production even when he's out, man. So, you know, it's, it's something to keep an eye on. And I'm just glad that we have changed everything to wait until we actually see who's not fucking playing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. Uh, another shot. I mean, Hanny Mokhtar plus plus one eighty. Another best yeah. ball shot for us there. We'll see. Uh, but Jonathan Rodriguez, Cabecita, now with the Portland Timbers, uh, scores in his debut, plus 250 here. They're on the road at Sporting KC, but plus 250 for a goal scorer like that. I mean, he's going to get double digits this year for sure. That that feels like decent value. Bro, it, him and Evander, man, that is yeah. just – that is. Bro, and they have another, they have another DP spot. It's absolutely absurd. Um, yeah, he, the guy's a stud that he's gonna, he's gonna run rampant through this league. Yeah. God, we are so close to being that team that other teams podcasts can say Austin has DP spots open still. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. All right. Anything else for you before we get out of here? Forecast calls for happy beers this weekend. Ooh, I like it. E forecast coming through on episode 131 of the North End podcast. And that. We'll do it for us, everybody. Uh, appreciate you tuning in. Thanks again to Brad Stuver for stopping by. Uh, we will see everybody at Q2 on Saturday. And we'll see you all back here Sunday night recapping Austin FC's matchup against San Jose, recapping some of those GA Cup premier bracket results, and talking everything else Austin FC that happens between now and then. Until then. Easy. And I'm Zach. Vamos Austin FC, everybody. Goodbye.